you, you know, when, when you default on your debt, you can't default on equity, right? You just pay less. Default is like the, the, the floor of death, you know, for debt. And the, that's, that's always going to be asymmetric. It's this fact that like you go below this point and like, bah, 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 game over. He was like, inflation's high. I'm going to defeat it. And, and we had spent sort of a decade or almost a decade dithering and saying, well, we can't defeat inflation. It would cause a recession. And we'll just have to live with it. Or maybe we'll do some price control. It didn't work. So instead, Volcker's like, guess what? I'm going to hike interest rates until inflation is done. Bam. And so then he did. And Congress hauled him in front of it and, and said like, what are you doing? You're destroying the country, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, and yet I will because the central bank is independent and I can do that if I want. Inflation is going to go. Welcome to Econ 102, where economist Noah Smith and I make sense of what's happening in the news, technology, business, and beyond through the lens of economics. Let's jump right in. Hey, Noah, how's it going? Hi, how's it going? <laughs> it's going okay. Thank you for making time. Excited to do this. Yeah. Noah, you just wrote a piece about uh, why our groceries are still so expensive. Um, and it touched on a bunch of topics that relates to inflation more broadly. And I want to do a deep dive on it with you. W why don't you unpack some of the major p uh, points you were trying to make in that piece, and then we can do a kind of deep dive on inflation more broadly. Well, yeah. So I think um, people realize that inflation is the biggest thing that makes people mad about the economy. Uh, and so that's why people have been so negative. And so we're, you know, trying to say, well, what would make people less mad? And of course, if you have been reading No Opinion, as all the listeners, of course, have, then you know that I think that basically we just have to wait. And in fact, there's some evidence showing that the impact of inflation uh, goes away with, a, you know, a lag of one to two years uh, in terms of or m maybe two years uh, in terms of how um, how much it's in the top people's minds. And so there's a very obvious mechanism for how that works. You know, you go to the grocery store. Oh my God, the prices are so high. You go to the grocery store. Oh my God, the prices are so high. You go to the grocery store. Okay. They're the same as last time, but you don't really notice things that are the same, right? You don't really notice when, when the inflation stops, when the rate of change goes to zero or goes down, right? You don't notice that the big changes are all are, are no longer coming because you only notice things when they happen. You don't notice things that don't happen. Right. And so over time you're like, Oh, you know, actually, those big price changes were just a one-off. I, you know, a year or two later, you're like, I guess that was just that time. You know, now it's now it's uh, kind of chilled out, and so it takes people a while to sort of recognize that because they don't really, you know, people don't normal people don't just sit there with their eyes glued to like the economic numbers, like you know, dorks like us do. That's the theory, and so it helps if the prices actually go back down because then you notice, wow, gas is so cheap this week. Wow, gas is so cheap this week. And it really rapidly forces you into this mentality of like things are getting cheaper. And we have evidence that people pay attention to gasoline prices more than any other price. And if you think about it, that makes sense because you fill up your car constantly all the time. Uh, and it's just this one thing, you know, grocery prices are a million things gasoline and, and, and you can substitute, right? If eggs are expensive this week, you can buy, I don't know, avocados, whatever you were feeling like you, like you can substitute to some degree with groceries. You can't really substitute with gasoline. I mean, you can take the, the train if you live in a place with a train, but no one does because it's America, um, except for you New Yorkers out there. You do. Everyone else does not. Um, and so you can't really do that. Uh, so basically gas is the most important price and gas prices have been coming down. Now they're not down all the way back to where they were before the pandemic, but they are cheaper. Gas is cheaper in dollar terms than it was 10 years ago. So if you go back to 2013, gas cost more dollars per gallon. And I'm not even talking about inflation adjusted prices of gas or anything like that. I'm talking about just the dollar price of gas that you see at the pump was more expensive in 2013 than it is now. Uh, of course, no one has 2013 in their minds, but they probably do have last year in their minds. And so they're, you know, gas prices have, have are like are in the process of crashing and it hasn't canceled out the entire run up since, uh, you know, the, the pandemic, but it's canceled out like most of it. And so that is going to drive improving consumer sentiment, I think. And, and lo and behold, you're starting to see consumer sentiment surveys kind of tick up the last month or so. And um, but the other thing that people buy all the time, as uh, I was mentioning, is food. So 
groceries are really important. And of course, you know, you need groceries, you need food to live even more than you need gas. And so it's really, really important. And when, you know, staples like bread and eggs and milk and, you know, meat and things like these, when these basic commodities uh, at the grocery store go up and up and up in price, you feel poorer and you're justified in feeling poorer because you are poorer. Like sort of the definition of poor is like, I can't afford to eat. And so, um, so definitely grocery prices are a big deal. Now, what happened with grocery prices is that uh, they went up and up and up uh, really fast for like a year and a half. And then they, they sort of stopped going up, right? If you look, it, it basically has been flat since mid-2022. And maybe people are just starting to notice that that run-up looks like a one-off. But it would be nice if grocery prices could actually go down like gas prices have gone down and make people realize quickly that the inflation is over. And also, of course, make people more able to buy food because that's good. And um, and so, yeah, so that's basically the overview. Uh, grocery prices haven't gone down. So I did this post to try to figure out why, ha what, what made grocery prices go up and what can that tell us about what could make them go down? Yeah. And, and you also identified some misconceptions that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't sort of Russia or commodity prices in general. Like you, uh, people often have misconceptions about what leads to um, either causing inflation or fighting inflation. Why don't you identify some of those? The, the most obvious thing that could cause increased food prices was the war in Ukraine. Um, because that is a lot of what caused high gas prices. And if you look at countries like Egypt that import a ton of like staple grains, you know, Egypt has these bread riots every time the international price of grain goes up. Um, but, uh, in the United States, so, so, so wheat prices went up and then they came back down like gasoline prices, corn prices went back up and then they came down like gasoline prices. And I was looking at those prices of those commodities. I'm thinking, oh yeah, okay, good. This is going to help people, uh, you know, afford more food. And, uh, it, it, it didn't, um, because grocery prices didn't go down. And if you look at, uh, flour, which is sort of, you know, halfway between the wheat and the bread. So like, you know, wheat prices went like up, 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 down, down, down. All the way back down, it, it, wheat is cheaper than it was before the pandemic in dollar terms. It's cheaper. It's, it's so cheap. Um, if you look at flour, it went up and then it went, started going down very slowly. So, so processed flour. Uh, and then if you look at bread, it went up and then it just stayed up and hasn't come down. And bread it have, behaves very similar to groceries as a whole, or at least right now. Uh, bread has behaved, let's say, very similar to groceries as a whole. And so... Um, Right now, what we're looking at is this plateau in the price of bread with a crash in the price of wheat. So I was like, okay, that's, that's anomalous. Let's look at the correlation there. And so I looked up some research on commodity prices and bread prices and, or food prices in general. And I found out that in the United States, there's almost no relationship. So commodity prices rise enormously and then crash enormously. Like uh, I'm talking about agricultural commodities. I'm talking about grain prices, right? Grain, meat, whatever. And then the actual price of groceries or the price of groceries, even that are just based on those commodities, like bread is based on wheat, uh, bear, you know, do not move much. And so there's very little effects of commodity prices on grain prices on, uh, grocery prices. And so this is, this is, you know, as the kids say, this is a black pill. This is, this is bad news because commodity prices can be reversed, but many prices cannot be reversed. They, you know, they can, you can stop them from growing, but once they grow that sort of growth that they, the period of growth they have, the rise they had is baked in. And that's what a lot of things behave like. And so unfortunately it looks like food is kind of like that. So the, the, the prospects for rapidly reversing uh, food prices depended on the idea that food prices were dependent on these agricultural commodities and they're not, um, it's not a big input. Most of the cost of food, almost all of the cost of food is uh, processing is the the cost of processing and selling the food. Yeah. Grain's incredibly cheap, and so yeah, so so that's the the black pill, I suppose, is that is that it's not commodities, it's not the war in Ukraine, it's not um, anything, and so it's not going to be reversed because those commodity prices have already reversed themselves. And um, uh, well, I guess except for for beef hasn't reversed itself, but but grains have reversed themselves, and so but but that's not going to matter. Um, and so that's, that's bad news. And so that was sort of the first thing I looked at. And then after that, I looked at some other things that are, uh, you know, also kind of obvious explanations that you'd think of, but that are also probably not the thing. So do you want me to talk about some of those? Yeah, please. All right. So then the, the next thing I, I, you know, talked about was, um, 
the pandemic consumption shift. So in the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, for a year or so, everybody hid inside their houses. They're like, oh, I don't want to go outside and get sick. Um, and so then they hid in their houses. We didn't really do any lockdowns, but people did hide in their houses because they didn't want to get sick. And so that happened. And then um, they uh, um, started eating food at home a lot more and uh, eating out a lot less because they're scared of getting sick. And so that happened. So I was like, oh, well, maybe that's it. Just a big shift in demand, right? And that's going to reverse itself when people go back and, and start eating at restaurants fully. And, and then I looked at the statistics, and unfortunately, this is not it either. People already started going back to restaurants just as much as they had before. It fully bounced back a very long time ago, like 2021, before the big inflation. Um, and if you look at prices of food at restaurants, it's the same. It has risen the same amount as prices of food at home, of prices of groceries, right? Prices of restaurant food and groceries have done basically the same thing. And so, so pandemic consumption shifts are not it either. And that was sort of, that's, that's unfortunate because that would have been an easy explanation, right? That would have been an easy sort of gimme. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, you know, people, when people talk about the, the cause of inflation, they talk a lot about supply chain snarls in the wake of the pandemic. You know, we had all these logistics uh, problems, uh, you know, um, container ships piling up in our ports, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually that worked itself out. But when I look at uh, that, the, that would all, the, the thing we import for agriculture, for, for making food is just commodities. We'll import some like, we, we actually grow most of our own, but we do import some food. And so that would have been the mechanism by which supply chain snarls would have caused the food inflation. But it didn't um, because agriculture, uh, agricultural commodities have basically very little to do with grocery prices. And so that's so it wasn't the supply chain snarls. It wasn't pandemic consumption shifts. It wasn't the war in Ukraine. And then um, one more thing that I looked at is um, is uh, rent. So you might think, OK, well, you know, rent has gone up and. Um, and, you know, agricultural businesses have to rent stuff. So maybe they're passing that cost on. Well, guess what? Commercial rent hasn't gone up because, uh, you know, what with work from home and whatnot, uh, the price of a factory or an industrial building like that across America has been fairly flat. It's gone up like a tiny bit, but it's fairly flat and has under, undershot overall inflation by quite a bit. So that's, that's not it either. Um, and then, and then finally, I looked at a greed monopoly power. So there's this idea uh, pushed by Elizabeth Warren and by a couple of heterodox economists like Isabel Weber that um, inflation has basically allowed or prompted companies to squeeze their customers for bigger profit margins and increased monopoly power has allowed them to do this and blah, blah, blah. So they're basically, you know, the, the companies are taking all the money and gouging you for food. Well, no. Because uh, grocery stores, it turns out, make almost no profit at all. They make like a 1% profit margin. Uh, tell me what a software business with a 1% profit margin, would would, would VCs want to fund that business? Uh, no, that's, that's not guess, a fundable business. Yes. Well, also, I mean, probably they don't have any profits yet. But okay, <laughs> but, but uh, a, a big company, a big tech company, yeah. like a Microsoft and 1% profit margins, people would think it sucked. Yeah. But out here, Kroger and Safeway and all these companies, th these people are making 1% profits. And so that, you know, they're not making any profit. So it's not, you know, if that's greed, that's incompetent greed, right? right. And so, and also there's, there's um, you know, evidence that monopoly power has actually decreased in the grocery industry. Um, competition has increased. Um, margins have fallen, blah, blah, blah. There, so anyway, this isn't it. Elizabeth Warren's making stuff up. She's wrong. Uh, and so that's not it either. So the, so greed, pandemic consumption shifts, uh, you know, rents, supply chain snarls and the war in Ukraine. It's none of those things. It's none of those things. All right. It's not those things. And so what is it? So anyway, um, I, I feel like I've rattled on a bit. No, no. I mean, we're getting to the cliffhanger. <laughs> let's let's hmm. get into it. All right. You just want to sit back and let me like recite my. <laughs> I... Hey, everybody. Eric here with a word from our sponsors. Have you ever wondered where your donation could have the most impact? In 2007, a group of donors had that exact question. But when they sought out information from charities to help them answer this question, they instead received cute pictures or unhelpful stories. Their experience led them to create GiveWell, an organization providing rigorous, transparent research about the best giving opportunities they've found. 
GiveWell has now spent over 15 years researching charitable organizations and only directs funding to a few of the highest impact opportunities they've found in global health and poverty alleviation. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high-impact giving. You can find all of their research and recommendations on their site for free. You can make tax-deductible donations to their recommended funds or charities, and GiveWell doesn't take a cut. If you've never donated through GiveWell before, you can have your donation matched up to $100 before the end of the year, or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org, pick podcast, and enter Econ 102 at checkout. Make sure they know that you heard about GiveWell from Econ 102 to get your donation matched. Again, that's GiveWell.org to donate or find out more. The next thing is wages. So if you look at the, you know, agriculture is a very intensive industry. So you, you grow the crops, that takes a lot of labor. You pick the crops, that takes a lot of labor. You process the food, you know, meat packing and, and whatnot, uh, you know, milling grain and turning it into flour and blah, 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 blah. And then you actually make the bread. Someone bakes the bread and then you put it in a plastic bag or a whatever, a, you know, paper box or whatever you do and shrink wrap it. I don't know. And then you send it to the grocery store and there's like you truck it all around and then you unload it from the truck and you put it in the store and then you sell it to people, put a little price tag on it and then you check people out at the store and then that's done. That's that's the whole supply chain that I just described to you. Every piece of that supply chain is incredibly labor intensive. All of this uses workers, workers, workers and workers get paid wages. And so wages dominate the cost of groceries in America. Um, I wouldn't say, so it's not all of the cost, you know, it's like, it's like a large percent, but it's not, it's not like the whole cost. But, but, but when you look at how wages in these industries have evolved or wages overall, grocery inflation is much higher. Grocery inflation is much higher than wages in these industries. It's likely that, so, so wages, um, risen by about as much, by about two thirds as much as grocery prices. Right. So, so. This this is probably part of the explanation. The wages of, of people in the food processing and retail industries uh, are a factor um, in in rising uh, in rising grocery costs, but they're not. They don't explain all of it, but they explain some of it. You know, probably. And then if you look at fuel, fuel's a big one. So remember, I said gas prices have gone down. Well, yes, they've come down, but they spent a really long time very high. Yep. And so. That's actually, so this is actually hopeful. This is the one, um, you know, hopeful sign uh, that we see is that, that gas prices are actually a big input into food stuff because you, you know, you have to run the harvester and then you use gas to run like all the vehicles that transport the materials. And then, you know, uh, also transport the pe all those people to their jobs, you know, they're driving to their jobs and then you have, uh, you know, trucks transport the stuff to the grocery store. So you've got a lot of gasoline. Uh, in these in these prices, uh, you've got a bit of you know like um, bit of coal, whatever, bit of like you know for trains. I don't know, but but mostly we're talking gasoline for transportation, trucks and cars, and machines that use diesel, right? And so so that's a big part. So transport cost is like it's not like a hugely dominant thing, but it's like it's in there. It's substantial, and um, I don't remember exactly what it, what the percent of cost was. I don't know twenty percent. I'm maybe making that up. I, I looked that up yesterday. So, but the point is that gas prices are now crashing and they're, they're not quite back down to pre pandemic levels, but they're, but they're kind of, um, back down, uh, you know, to a large degree. And so that may actually decrease the price of groceries. So we've got the wage rise, we, uh, which is not going away, nor, uh, you know, nor should we necessarily want it to go away. Um, because I would like agricultural workers to get paid a decent living wage and, uh, you know, how, what yeah. do you think? Should agricultural workers be paid a decent? Okay, oh. sure. I'm not going to speak against them on, yeah. on, on, on this podcast. I um, that, that being said, okay, the, yeah. the, there's going to be a downward pressure on the wage of agricultural workers from the massive surge in uh, low skilled immigration that we've been receiving as a result of this asylum spamming thing that we talked about in the previous podcast. All these uh, you know asylum seekers. A lot of these people are going to go work in the ag industry because um, that's where you work in America if you don't have a lot of skills or language skills. Um, and so 
you know, it's, it's the very basic job. Like in, um, in On the Road by Jack Kerouac, when he's like hitchhiking across America uh, to like see his buddies in San Francisco and New York, on the way, he pays for his way by working as an agricultural worker. Yeah. So it's just like the most basic job you can get. And, um, uh, and so he did have language skills, but he wasn't particularly sober anyway. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so, so that's going to put downward pressure on those wages. Uh, immigration doesn't put downward pressure on wages in general, but in specific industries, it, it, it can, but if yeah. immigration is highly weighted toward those industries. So, so that what, could, that could happen. Um, and so, yeah. When people talk about Go subsidies going to farmers or agriculture in, industry is, is that related to this or is that something separate? Um, probably not given that, uh, you know, these companies are not really making a lot of profit. Got it. Right. Those subsidies are basically insurance and export subsidies. Uh, unsubsidized farm industries are very subject to boom and bust cycles. Like unsubsidized uh, farm industries are actually why you get like famines. Hmm. Uh, farm subsidies are not the most efficient way of doing that. So, a, a you know, a insurance program uh, with, you know, some sort of targeted like production incentives. There's, there's ways that are more efficient than just throwing money, rain or shine at the farm industry. But they're not like a lot more efficient. And so... Uh, you know, we, we started farm subsidies as a, as a depression fighting measure. So we keep producing food. If you don't want grocery price spikes, do farm subsidies. So, so our farm subsidies are actually much better than the way that Europe or Japan does it. They subsidize inefficiency while we actually subsidize giant agribusinesses. So we, we say oh, we're, we'll protect on the family farm. A, you don't want to protect the family farm because the family farm is only efficient at a very low level of GDP. Uh, the family farm basically works if it's like a garden, but then the family yeah. farm of like a small farm, you know, with like our, our classic, like, you know, guy with a tractor from the depression or whatever, that's the, those are terribly inefficient. And we got rid of them. The family farms are gone. We subsidize big agribusiness and um, <clears throat> this is good. Uh, so farm subsidies are not like they're, they easily can turn into a bad thing. So ours are the least bad farm subsidies out there. America's farm subsidies. And they haven't, more importantly, they haven't changed, right? We, it's not like we suddenly just dished out like a shit ton of farm subsidies in 2021 and early 2022. That didn't happen, right? Like we were subsidizing farms in, um, in the 2010s when like grocery prices actually fell. So here's, here's another thing that's, that's weird that's going on that I noticed. Uh, grocery prices lagged wages humongously in the 2010s. So from about 2015 through about 2019, um, grocery prices fell and wages kept rising and rising. And the recent price rise has only served to catch grocery prices back up to what they would have been if they had risen during the 2010s in line with wages exactly. So basically, you can say that food prices just, you know, love Trump and hate Biden. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with that. It's about some kind it's about competitive structure. It's about the fact that like online retailers were coming on and creating a bunch of competition. And like now that competition sort of got shaken out in the pandemic and now the normal equilibrium is being restored, blah, blah, blah. That's the most likely explanation off the top of my head. You know, wave hands, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Make something up. But but the point is that that may be that's that's sort of a, another uh, you know, pessimistic outlook is the idea that grocery prices had to catch up because they were so low for so long that their costs were rising and that their, their, you know, prices were not, that were actually falling. Like that's a recipe for long-term you, that's unsustainable long-term. Eventually they had to raise prices or die. And so finally they raised prices. Um, and so that's, that's an argument that we're not going to see lower grocery prices because uh, we simply lucked out during the 2010s and should have had higher grocery prices than uh, instead of now. Yeah. So there is that possibility. That's a good overview. I, I want to zoom out and do just a little bit of a, you know, true to the spirit of our name, you know, Econ 102 or maybe even 101 on, on inflation. By the way, when you, when you, whenever you say that's a good overview, that's my sign that I talk too long. I'm, no, I'm no, no. like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I overviewed again. <laughs> no, no. Uh, the, fan, anyway. the fans love it. Uh, that's what they come here for. Um, the, um, Those are the last words in the Bible, by the way. That's a good overview. <laughs> yeah. um, exactly. <laughs> Hey everybody, Eric here with a word from our sponsors. 
If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlined accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, and netsuite.com slash 102. NetSuite.com slash 102 to get your own KPI checklist. NetSuite.com slash 102. Inflation. Why do we have inflation at all? You know, why, why is the Fed's mandate two percent or, or, or whatever it is? Is it because we have debts to pay? Is it because people need to feel a bit richer? Or why, why don't you give some of the context and historical overview for that development? Um. So we had inflation for a number of reasons. Basically, uh, three things happened. The first thing that happened was those supply chain snarls after the pandemic. The second thing that happened, well, it happened concurrently uh, or even before, was that we. Um, pumped the government pumped a crap ton of money into the economy, both by the, you know, classic printing money, but also by lending cheap money and also by having the government spend money. So we had a three pronged a way of pumping like butt tons of money into the economy. And then the third thing that happened was, was um, uh, Putin invaded Ukraine and gas prices went up. Mm -hmm. Those are the reasons we got inflation and exactly how much of each one was responsible for inflation is something that, uh, you know, sort of Fed researchers will argue about forever and that, uh, you know, econ commentators will argue about slightly less expertly forever. You know, we're talking about aggregate supply and aggregate demand here, which some, maybe someday I should explain that, but on the podcast, but um, well, basically, let's aggregate make that today. Supply, this, today, today is a 101, right. 102 day. Yeah, well, let's, let's get into all it. All right. So, so normally when we think about supply and demand, we think about just like oranges, you know, the supply and demand for oranges. Aggregate supply and aggregate demand are actually the supply and demand for just like everything you might sell or create in an economy. It's the supply and demand for everything. So you can say, okay, well, how can you, what can you buy besides everything? Like if you buy more of everything, what do you buy less of? And the answer is money. So aggregate supply is the supply of everything that isn't cash. You know, it's the supply of oranges and back massages and computer chips and, and whatever you know, um, but everything that's not just cash and aggregate demand is the demand for everything that's not cash. That's what those are. And so things that increase aggregate demand are things that make people want more stuff and less cash. So for example, when you cut interest rates, you know, when you cut interest rates, I'm like, okay, this, this cash sucks. I can't get interest payments on it. So I better get rid of it by buying real stuff. So then you want to buy more stuff. And then when you, you know, have the government spend money, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, people just have all this excess cash sitting around and they're like, oh, I've got too much cash. I got to buy some stuff. And so you increase the aggregate demand by making people want more stuff and less cash. Aggregate supply, um, aggregate supply basically depends on, um, just the cost of production across the whole economy. So aggregate supply is more like normal supply. Aggregate demand is a little bit different because it's demand because it has to do with cash. Aggregate supply, honestly, is just um, is just like the pr economy's productive power. So, like you know, if uh, oil prices get cheaper, that increases aggregate supply because like oil is a critical input into a lot of things. Um, if uh, if we have a productivity boom, that increases aggregate supply, like a technology boom or or you know an improvement in our laws, like that allows us to build more stuff, then those will create. Um, or, or, or trade, you know, opening up trade with a whole bunch of countries so that we can get those gains from trade. Those will create, uh, those will create productivity booms. And so those will um, increase uh, aggregate supply. And so you can just think about aggregate supply and demand as just your typical like cross, you know? Uh, so if, if, um, if aggregate demand goes up, then we'll produce more stuff because people will be buying more stuff instead of holding cash. So we'll produce more stuff. But at the same time, it will uh, raise inflation because it'll, you know, 
make stuff more valuable relative to cash. Yeah. And so that's, you know, just like if the demand for oranges goes up, people will pay more for oranges. If the demand for aggregate goes up, people will pay more for aggregate. And that means inflation. Right. Right. When people pay more for everything, more cash for everything, that means inflation. So that's um so yeah, so that's that's what aggregate supply and demand is. Um and so when the Fed cuts rates and when the Fed pumps money to the economy, when the Fed loans cheap money to everybody, this is an increase in aggregate demand. You're flooding the economy with cash. When the government does a big deficit finance stimulus, this is flooding the economy with cash and that increases aggregate demand. And uh, and that's what we did during the pandemic. And that boosted the economy. It especially boosted the economy after the pandemic, you know, when people started spending again. Um, it really boosted the economy and it helped get us back to full employment very quickly, but it also caused inflation. So that was the positive aggregate demand shock was sort of us boosting ourselves to our feet really fast after this shock, this tremendous shock of the pandemic at a cost of accelerating inflation for a while. Um, and that was the aggregate demand shock. Now the aggregate supply shocks, there were two of them. One of them was, well, logistics, right? We couldn't, um, we couldn't uh, import stuff because uh, suddenly we're buying all these goods instead of services and, and the pandemic disrupted everything. And so, so that reduced aggregate supply. And then the war in Ukraine, which, which increased gas prices temporarily, increased uh, oil prices temporarily, that um, reduced aggregate supply as well. So, so we had a, two negative supply shocks and one positive aggregate demand shock. Uh, demand shock. And those sort of all conspired to raise inflation. Mm -hmm. So just for those listening at home, when we raise interest rates, that makes cash more valuable and thus reduces uh, aggregate demand. Exactly. Right. When we raise interest rates, and now this isn't, a normal person isn't going to think, wow, I could make so much money in a, in a money market account right now. I'm going to buy less groceries this week. You know, normal people don't think like that. Businesses are who think like that. Okay. Right. Businesses think you know, do I want to, do I want to spend this cash? Right. Yeah. Businesses think, do I want to borrow money? You raise interest rates and then businesses find it harder to borrow. Right. Like unlike in venture world, most businesses finance themselves with debt. Right. And so when the interest rates go up and interest rates go up, they can't finance themselves. Like GM is like, shit, it costs so much money to borrow. We better not build a new factory or something. Right. And then, um, and so, or, well, the thing it acts most on is real estate. Real estate's so interest rate sensitive. Like if you don't need developers, like when rates go up, they're just like, oh, my God, we can't build anything now because like it costs too much to borrow money. The cost of capital is too high. Right. And so um, and so they don't they don't buy things. And so that means that there's less investment, less borrowing means less investment, less spending, less employment, less payments to people. And that's going to filter through to less consumption, um, you know, so less money in the economy uh, as a whole. And, um, and that's just basically how that works. So it's all aggregate demand. Re interest rate hikes really work through the business side primarily. Although what's funny is that in all the economic models, they just assume it works through the consumer side, but it doesn't. It's, they, they make that up. And so, yeah, that's why raising interest rates is uh, you know, a measure to fight, to fight inflation. Um, but I want to zoom out even for, for someone who's new to some of these ideas and asking kind of basic questions of like, you know, why do we have inflation at all in terms of, um, you know, we've had 2% inflation for, I think on average for, for some time, I, I believe that's the target is, is 2% inflation. Why, why do we want yes. a mild form of inflation? Why, why don't we want deflation? Why don't you just give some of the sort of historical context for how this con uh, sort of this goal developed? Right. Well, so, so at, there used to be a time when people thought defla either deflation was good or 0% inflation was good. And then there were a bunch of arguments about whether or not this was good. And people sort of settled on the idea that low and stable inflation is actually good. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. One reason is that so low and state. So in, when you have a positive rate of inflation, you can cut people's wages without saying, hi, you have a wage cut. So sometimes... You know, we don't like the idea of cutting wages, but we also don't like the idea of laying people off. And sometimes companies face a choice between cutting people's wages and laying people off. We would rather they cut wages than lay people off in general. And generally, people would like that too. Uh, wage cuts are no fun. Layoffs are even less fun. So uh, if you have 2% inflation, you can, um, you can simply give people flat salary and then they're getting a real wage cut. 
And so it's very, very culturally difficult to give people a wage cut in terms of headline, not actual dollar wages. I like to say, sorry, you're, um, you know, of course, Silicon Valley solves this by having compensation in terms of stock, right? You're like, well, hey, I'm still giving you this number of shares. They're just worth a lot less. And they're like, hey, can I have a refresher? And you're like, oh, maybe. And then, you know, so that's how you cut wages in Silicon Valley. But most places do not have RSUs, right? Most people or, or options or whatever. Most places have, you know, just a check. And so if you're saying, hi, George, I'm sorry, you used to make $110,000 a year and now you make $90,000 a year. I'm sorry. And then like, nobody likes that. And then like right. that, it reduces morale. People get so upset. So, so Japan handles this a different way, by the way. So what Japan does is it basically pays out bonuses. Interesting. Um, a large percent of compensation is bonus based sure. in Japan. Japan has no problem cutting wages. Um, maybe it's too easy to cut wages because Japanese wages have gone down forever and they might have let, uh, you know, low wages substitute for, you know, um, actual like product development. So you, so you don't always want to cut. So cutting wages isn't, isn't generally good. It's just that we don't want it to be something that you can never, ever, 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 ever do. And so having slight inflation can help with that. And it's a little grim to say that, but that's one, one way that it could help. Um, there are other reasons too. So inflation erases debt. Yeah. So when you have unexpected inflation, um, erases debt. Deflation exacerbates debt. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure actually that matters much in terms of 2% versus zero, but you definitely don't want deflation because you get something called debt deflation. You get this horrible cycle with deflation, by the way. Yeah. Where if you have, if you have, yeah, so I guess this, this really does matter. So, so if you have, if you have deflation, um, deflation makes your debts get bigger in real terms, right? Cause you're still owe, you know, like you still owe $20,000 or whatever, but now $20,000 is a, is a lot more painful cause your wages in, in a deflationary regime. Remember that in a deflationary regime, your wages go down, your nominal wages go down. So in a true deflationary regime, your salary gets less every year, even as the price of groceries and gas and rent get less every year. That's what a long-term deflationary regime looks like. And um, people would not like for, people would not like that, right? Imagine if you're if prices get cheaper every year, but your salary gets lower every year, and like you're like, well, uh, I'm making less money, but at least things are cheaper. Like you know. Um, that's uncomfortable situation to be in because you keep having to check the price and make sure you're like the, 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 your smaller and smaller paycheck every year, uh, you know, is actually not smaller in real terms. Um, this is why the, the, by the way, the people who say that like, uh, well, we'll get to this in a sec, but the people who say that like technological innovation causes deflation are wrong, by the way. Hmm. Um, but, but we'll get to that in a sec, but so, um, deflation is really bad because you get, trapped into the cycle where debts get harder to pay off and then people can't like default on their debts and that hurts the economy. Um, this is what happens in depressions. And so deflation is like very harmful for economies. Japan was in deflation for a long time and it basically just made debts very severe. Uh, and so that's why they kept trying to get out of it. Um, it can really hurt the real economy a lot over time. So you don't want to have deflation and 0% inflation. If you just maintain perfect price stability, you're kind of balanced on the knife edge where as soon as you tip into deflation, you start getting more debt defaults, which give you more deflation and, and cause a recession and blah, 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 um, as well as making everyone poorer. So, so you, you don't want that to happen. So, so 2% inflation gives you a little bit of a cushion, right? With 2% inflation, you can have a recession that pushes inflation down by 2% without sending you into deflation. And a deflation is asymmetrically dangerous because of the way we do debt. If everyone were equity finance, this wouldn't be a problem. The fact that everyone's debt finance makes this a problem because, um, you, you know, when, when you default on your debt, you can't default on equity, right? You just pay less, right? If you make less earnings, you pay less money to your shareholders or whatever with debt, you can default and default is asymmetric. When you do really, really well, your company doesn't, there's no like break point where your company suddenly like pays you a crap time. You, you suddenly pay a lot more money to the people you, your bondholders, right? There's not, well, okay, there, there's like convertible debt. So there is that. But, um, but 
and there's, there's options, there's other things, but, but default is like the, the, the floor of death, you know, for debt. And the, that's, that's always going to be asymmetric. It's this fact that like you go below this point and like bah, 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 game over. And so that's, that's how debt works. And um, that was, that's, that's going to be the opening. Yeah. Opening totally. open there. The, <laughs> Bom, bom, bom. <laughs> you know, like yeah. when you when you touch the floor of death and like like portal or some game. Yeah, yeah video game. God, I'm old. Um, God, what do kids play even now? <laughs> oh man, do you know, know. Do you know what video games kids play? Can we just be like old and like say we don't know what kids are doing now? Because like they used to play like like um, Halo. I don't know Fallout or like League of Legends, but like what do they play now? It's it's been. They used like... to play Minecraft. 20 years since I uh, was an active video video gamer, but uh, now kids just go on TikTok and like support Hamas or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and get depressed right. apparently. Uh, you know, like uh, Instagram. Depressed. Yeah. depressed Hamas supporters are our children. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Ugh, let's just start a nuclear war. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. So deflation sucks. Nobody likes deflation, and if, low inflation gives us a little bit of cushion. You mentioned uh, technological innovation doesn't cause deflation. Or isn't deflationary? Why, why is that? So um, in the short term, it, it, it can be for reasons that are boring and I won't go into. In the long term, uh, it raises supply and demand. Hmm. In the long term, technological innovation raises supply, but then the, you know it also raises people's incomes, which raises demand as well. Um, it doesn't fundamentally change the, um, the price of stuff relative to cash. Well... Let me say that it all depends on, on whether the, the central bank accommodates the, the technological innovation. So if suppose you, you didn't have, uh, so let, let's think of a really cool thing that we could invent. What's, what's a cool gizmo that we could have that we don't have today? Like a flame I don't know, flame. Neuralink? What? Like what? <laughs> flamethrower, yeah. So suppose that we get flamethrowers. By the way, uh, as a side note, the, the law that banned flamethrowers in the 2010s, because they were legal before, yeah. the law that banned flamethrowers was called the Flamethrowers Really Act. <laughs> That's funny. And if you look this up, it's the Flamethrowers Really Act. <laughs> <laughs> flamethrowers? Really? Uh. Um, so anyway, uh, flamethrowers were legal. They're sadly not now. You can't it's no longer legal to build your own like flamethrower and like blast shit in your backyard. The glory days of America are over. <sighs> Started with your war. <laughs> anyway, um, so then freedom is gone, man. We were land exactly. free it's with over. flamethrowers. All right. So suppose someone invents a really cool flame. Let's let's say like a little um, flamethrower ring. We can put this yes. ring on. Um, well, I have this friend in, in fintech, and for the longest time, her Facebook photo was a GIF of her on a boat in a bikini with a flamethrower attached to her arm, blasting a giant cloud of fire. And it was the most metal thing I have ever seen. And unfortunately, Facebook made it impossible to have gifts as your profile pic. So, oh, no. so I need to see if she still has that gift saved because it is just like, it, it, it's, it's just like, you know, it looks like some sort of comic book. Like, yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, anyway. Suppose we invent the flamethrower ring where you can just blast people with fire. Um, and then everyone needs one, right? Everyone wants one. So this is technological innovation, right? And so now people need more cash to buy this other thing. You know, it used to be that you bought a washing machine and like a little, you know, like um, Ura ring or, you know, and like pillows and rabbit food and whatever you bought. Now you're buying all of those plus a flamethrower ring. So you need more cash. Mm -hmm. The... Fed is happy to help you with this. And the Fed will give you the extra cash you need to buy your yearly flamethrower ring. But the Fed is not the only actor who can do this. So banks can also do this. So what, what is not commonly appreciated is that the Fed um, affects the money supply, but does not control the money supply. It, the Fed is only one of the people who affects the money supply. Um, banks, by lending by by just doing more lending actually increase the money supply. And there's a little like toy explanation we have called the money multiplier, which explains like how many times banks will like do fractional reserve lending. That's not what they really do. Really, they just, you know, they have a certain amount of reserves and they lend a certain amount of money. But basically when a bank lends you money, you're, you're like, hey, hi bank, can I borrow some money? I need money 
for my world destroying laser. I mean, I mean my, my, you know, SaaS startup. And then, so you go to the bank and you borrow this money and then you're like, and then the bank, uh, how does the bank lend you the money? The bank creates a little file and says, Eric Chornberg now has, you know, uh, um, $500,000 for his giant laser, right? Where'd that $5,000 come from? You just wrote it down. That's called printing money. Banks print money. We have laws that limit the amount of money banks are allowed to produce. So banks can't print infinite money, um, but they can create quite a lot of money. And when the Fed does monetary policy, it does, it does so by affecting how much, by doing things that affect how much money banks are, want to create or trying to do that anyway. So, so the banks are out there creating money. So when you have, when you invent the, the flamethrower ring and people need more cash to, to buy it, all you need, you don't even need the Fed to do anything, right? The Fed will do something, right? Ultimately, the Fed tries to keep the money supply growing, you know, but, but really you don't need it. All you need are banks to create loans to buy these rings and then more money exists. And so, so bank create money. They create more money to buy the rings. So suppose everybody just takes out a loan to buy the ring, right? Um, the net debt in the economy changes by zero, right? Because uh, all those debts are owed to someone. And suppose there's no foreigners, right? We're not borrowing from China to buy the ring. We're borrowing from each other. People who want, you know, everyone wants to buy the ring. So everyone buys some, borrows some money to buy the ring. And the amount of cash in, in the world increases and everybody buy, now everybody has their ring and there's more cash and the balance of supply and demand is just the same as it was before. And that's what happens in the long term. So the idea that um, the idea that technology, new technology pushes prices down, um, it would except that we create more cash to buy those things and that pushes prices up and eventually it all evens out which is good because remember that that world of deflation would suck because you'd see your paycheck shrink every month. So when when there's the the favorite chart that people like to point to of you know certain services we've alluded to it in previous episodes certain services uh, prices go up like healthcare you know education um, housing etc and certain things prices go down uh, consumer electronics the implication there is that uh, things that are allowed to have more technological innovation because they're less regulated, um, prices are going to go down. Is, is that too simplistic? Of is, or is that directionally right? You're not really talking about like inflation, the overall price level there. You're talking about the price of education relative to yes. food, relative to an hour of labor, relative to this microphone. You're talking about those relative prices and you're saying education is getting relatively more expensive. Um, inflation isn't really, and money supply and all this macro stuff isn't really going to affect that that much. Technology will affect that a lot. So um, you can make all of these things get cheaper relative to like labor and you make real wage. That's called wages. Real wages go up, right? It's called real incomes go up. You make everything, you make everything cheaper relative to an hour of labor by making it produced more efficiently by improving technology. So with education, we may soon do this with AI tutors, right? You may have GPT four or five or six or whatever sit there and like educate you like in that book, The Diamond Age, uh, you may have this little, um, we discussed The Diamond Age, right? On a previous show. Yeah, yeah, oh, we alluded to it. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, we should have like uh, our, our sci-fi sci -fi hour where we just talk about sci-fi. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Let's, let's do that for the holidays. Let's yeah, do, yeah, let's do sci-fi episode. Um, yeah. yeah, so, so anyway, Diamond Age, it's, it's about this, this girl with like a, an AI tutor thing. And, yeah. um, and so that that's going to happen. And that could bring down the cost of education because people are like, uh, I could, you know, like send my kids to public school or I could have them sit at home with an AI tutor and then, you know, interact with their friends on Snapchat. I don't know that I endorse that as like a social thing for socializing kids, but parents could decide that. And then that would make it super cheap. That would be really cheap uh, to do that. Um, and then they, so private school could just collapse. There could be no more private school and all the kids getting into the top colleges who ha would have gone to private school are now just people are like, I used my AI tutor or they're not even getting into colleges. Maybe they're just going like right into the workforce because like we have so many ways to party now and meet other young people now that nobody needs to go to college for the social stuff either. So maybe the whole world has become like a young people college 
maybe college has just become like the whole world of young people now. And, and Twitter is our dorm room, stupid dorm room discussions. And, uh, and that's what everybody, that's what everybody does. So, so, so there's all these speculation about how these things change, but, um, ultimately what technology does is it changes it. It makes real incomes go up. It, it makes things cheaper, n like not in the sense of like inflation going down, but in the sense of everything becomes cheaper relative to the price of an hour of labor. Hmm. You know, my labor can now, because look at, look at this. We, the, the houses we live in are just incredibly opulent compared to the houses people lived in a hundred years ago. Right. Even if you live in pricey San Francisco. Um, but especially if you live in like, you know, Texas. Um, oh, but I, I've had a, I've had a, um, a request by the way, to do an entire episode in Texas accent, but we'll have to think about that. <laughs> we oh, can do okay. one on Texas's economy and then I'll just do the entire thing in a Texas accent. And then we, we need to get someone who has do like, you a, give us very, a little preview? like, you know, natural, who, who naturally uses a very strong Texas accent. We need to get Austin Goolsby. <laughs> He's got like the best accent. And so anyway, over time, what technology does is it increases it decreases the price of stuff relative to the price of an hour of, of your time. And that means you can afford more stuff. So it makes you richer. That's not deflation. That's called an increase in real wages. Deflation is a macro thing where your wage goes down and prices go down at the same time, right? Deflation is where your paycheck shrinks every month and prices shrink to match. That would suck. You wouldn't like that. What you want is for your paycheck to either stay the same or go up every year and for prices to go down so you can afford more stuff right? That's what you want. That's not deflation necessarily. That That's called an increase in real wages. It's an increase in the price of your labor relative to the price of stuff you want to buy, exchange your labor for. Yeah. Is it true that there's a, a few decade duration from maybe the 80s to you know 2010s where we held inflation at more or less 2% at following the big inflation of the 70s? Yes. Although that if you look at um, historical inflation, it didn't actually go to 2% until like the late 90s, I think. So then um, uh, um, let me look let me look at exactly when that went. But yes, so there, were, there was a long time um, where we, we basically did that. Um, how, how did we get so good at that and what, what changed? Well, okay, so when did we exactly get to 2%? It was really 90, it was really like the, the early 90s. When we got, it was really like 1992 or three when we got there. Um, inflation was in 1990. Inflation was 5.4 percent. Yep. So like we were still on a little bit of a rocky roller coaster in the 1980s, but uh, by the 90s it had really uh, cooled down. How do we do that? Well, uh, the common explanation everyone gives is expectation anchoring. So in the 70s we had high inflation. And then Jimmy Carter hired this guy named Paul Volcker, very tall man. I met him once. He's dead now, unfortunately. Mm. Um, very tall guy, uh, you know, just like smoke, chomped a cigar. And like, you know, uh, he was like, inflation's high. I'm going to defeat it. And, and we had spent sort of a decade or almost a decade dithering and saying, well, we can't defeat inflation. It would cause a recession. Maybe we'll just have to live with it. Or maybe we'll do some price control. Didn't work. So instead, Volcker's like, guess what? I'm going to hike interest rates until inflation is done. Bam. And so then he did. And Congress hauled him in front of it and, and said, like, what are you doing? You're destroying the country, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, and yet I will because the central bank is independent and I can do that if I want. Inflation is going to go. So he just did. He just hiked interest rates and hiked them, hiked them, hiked them. And inflation went, <laughs> fell off a cliff. And we had two steep recessions. The first recession uh, probably made Jimmy Carter lose the 1980 election. Very painful. The second recession was incredibly painful. That was during Reagan. Incredibly painful. And just during like the first year of Reagan's uh, presidency and just completely clobbered the country. And like, you know, that was when the Rust Belt really happened. And that was when you got like, you know, Bruce Springsteen, blue collar blues and all that stuff. And like the devastation of all this stuff. This was all during that recession and it never really came back. It wasn't China. I mean, China hurt more. China did more stuff, but China didn't cause the Rust Belt. Um, the Rust Belt really began when we had that recession, but inflation went down a lot as a result of that. That was sort of your old fashioned Keynesian sort of inflation crush. You actually, the way they killed inflation 
was by uh, actually making people poor until people couldn't afford to buy things because they were all out of work and they couldn't afford to buy things. And so companies had to cut their prices. And that was that. That was tough and hard and mean. But after that, after that pain, we had decades where we didn't have to do that ever again. Because the fact that Volcker had done that made people know that the Fed would do that again. Hmm. And the fact that Volcker's successors, you know, Alan Greenspan, um, Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, um, the, you know, his success, by the way, they all kept getting uh, shorter and shorter. So, so you know, Volcker, uh, Greenspan, Bernanke, <laughs> uh, Yellen. Yeah. We should do a whole um, so, episode so on the Fed. They, yeah. As the Fed chairs got shorter, the, the interest rates also went down. The height, of, there's a correlation between the two. And, uh, but notice that from Yellen to Powell was a big step up. So Powell raised interest rates. So the correlation is, the, the, is unbroken. It's really a predictor. So let's, if you want to cut interest rates, just nominate someone short. Um, short Kings. It, short Kings. It'll be hard to find someone shorter than Jenny Yellen. She's a real yeah. Um So that means interest rates are getting getting higher for the rest of the rest of the decade if we can't find uh Well no, I mean Powell's like he's like medium height. Okay. <laughs> so but anyway. Um no, that's made up. Anyway, so so the point is that for during the nineties and um you know, during the nineties and during the two thousands and during the twenty tens. Everybody thought if inflation gets high, we will Volcker it. We will crush it. You know, we'll do what we did before. And everyone just believed that. And when, you know, if you believed, so, so suppose that like you were, you, you, someone told you to like walk along a line, right? And they said, if you go to the right or the left, I'm going to hit you with this, this stick. And you're like, uh, you won't hit me with that stick. And then you like go to the left and then someone's like, whap, whap, whap. And they're like, ah, oh! and then you go back on the line and then you go to the right. And someone's like, whap, whap, whap. And then you go, ah, oh! and go back on the line. Right. And then finally you learn that there's the person's there with the stick. And after that, they don't have to hit you. You've learned. And so the economy didn't have to be hit again. It had learned. And so people knew that the Fed would do what it took. This is called expectation anchoring in economics. People knew that the Fed would do what it took, whatever it took to keep inflation around 2%. Um, and during the, during the Great Recession, there was, uh, it actually let inflation get a little lower than 2%. And people started complaining that 2% was a ceiling rather than a target. And so you may have had some like erosion of the expectations anchor, and we can talk about that. But basically, the story is that for decades, nobody was willing to, to raise their prices because they knew that if enough people did that, the Fed would whack them down and they'd have to just cut their prices again. So anticipating that there would be no price hikes, nobody hiked prices more than like 2% a year. Well, some people hiked it more, some people liked it less, but on average, uh, people knew that the Fed um, meant business. And so the best, one, one explanation for the inflation after COVID is that um, COVID was such an emergency and the Fed just pushed so much money into the economy that people sort of, and, and also the memory of Volcker had faded, like the people who were like managing money or managing businesses in 1981 were like retired or dead, you know? And so, so that, that institutional memory had gone away. And so that now people like thought, oh my gosh, the Fed is really super easy. And then in, in 2021, the Fed did not raise interest rates, even as inflation from, you know, pandemic supply chain stuff and from all the money the Fed had pushed into the economy and from all the money the government that had spent, you know, was just coursing through the economy and causing all this inflation with demand and supply shocks. Even with all the stuff, the Fed didn't uh, hike interest rates during 2021. So you because they thought it was transitory? Inflation, yes. And because they were scared. Because they were more scared of unemployment than they were scared than they were of inflation because inflation was this distant memory. Um, this like this ancient monster that like, you know, many people were like, this monster shall break its bounds and come back to our world someday. Soon this monster will come back and they're like, ha, 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 that's just an old fairy tale, ha, 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 like in all the books, right? And then so, of course, the monster, then the monster is like, hmm, I guess I'll come back now. Rah! And so, um, so inflation came back and you started to see long-term inflation expectations, five-year inflation expectations, even 10-year rise, 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 rise 
inflation expectations looked like they were starting to become de-anchored. At that point, the Fed freaked out. And the Fed was like, okay, so we're losing the credibility we built up during Volcker. We're squandering this great inheritance we got from Volcker. We are going to reestablish it now. And so they hiked interest rates extremely quickly when they started hiking. Interest rates went to 5% much faster than they had before. So the Fed, once it started moving, once expectations moved, the Fed got scared. And once the Fed got scared, it hauled ass. And it hiked interest rates really fast. And you saw those expectations go right back down. So that sort of incipient doubt about whether or not the Fed was still the Volcker Fed died quickly. We reestablished anchored inflation expectations um, with rapid action. And that was good. That was a huge success by Powell. Powell really saved our macro economy. When he did that, he waited too long to do it. Um, but when he did it, he did it quick. And he reestablished those expectations, those long-term expectations. And, and at, when, when I saw those expectations get re-anchored, I thought inflation will will now follow. Actual inflation is not going to be way above expectations for like forever and ever and ever. Because those expectations, by the way, are not simply surveys, right? There's not like going around to business people asking, what do you think inflation will be? It's um, it's actually uh, traders betting in the market on what inflation is going to be. And if they are wrong about that bet, they lose enormous amounts of money. And so, of course, they read the news, they talk to business people, they have models, whatever, right? They probably know as much as anybody knows. And so, um, so when those market expectations flatlined and, and went back to the 2% target, I said, okay, well, I think this means that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to beat inflation. And we did. And uh, actual inflation did end up, fall the expectations were not, did, do not appear wrong. Uh, actual inflation has come back down. And so what we did was we were almost about, we were about to lose the inheritance of Volcker. We were about to lose the this expectation anchor that we had built up over decades. And we acted and the Fed let, in 2021, the Fed made a mistake by letting uh, inflation go on too long without raising rates. That mistake manifested in the form of rising long-term expectations, de-anchored, we could say. And then the Fed rectified its mistake very quickly and corrected course and then started doing the right thing and inflation came down. And note that there has not been a big rise in unemployment. There was a small rise in unemployment in the early, you know, in, in early 2022. It looked like we were going to have like a mild recession then. Uh, we ended up not because oil prices came down. But the point is that the Fed, the Fed achieved a soft landing. You know, it, it brought inflation down without creating the economy like Volcker had done. And obviously falling oil prices helped that and the end of the pandemic supply chain snarls helped that. But expectations were really important. Reestablishing those, those, those anchored long-term inflationary expectations by taking quick action to reassure the country that this was still like basically Volcker time, that Volcker's spirit still hangs over the Fed and guides its hand. Uh, that, was, that was crucial. And many economic models say, if you, um, if you are able to affect expectations, you can have what they call a costless disinflation. You can have, you can bring, infl if you can bring inflation expectations down, you know, you can bring, it is possible, um, although we're not sure if anyone had ever done it, but it's possible to uh, bring inflation down without hurting the real economy. And it appears, knock on wood, that Powell has done this, that we have accomplished it. And that by manipulating, by, by showing that, the, the Fed was still hawkish. The Fed uh, has, has reduced long-term inflation expectations uh, without really substantially hurting the real economy so far, knock on wood. This has been a great uh, uh, deep dive uh, and overview on uh, so, uh, inflation as well as some, some history. Uh, Noah, always, uh, always a pleasure and excited to do more episodes where we dive into some, uh, some economic history. Good to, uh, good to give a shout out to Volcker here and uh, in the future we'll, uh, we'll do some other um, maybe we'll get to Keynes and you know some, some other uh, his, historical figures as well. Yeah, thanks, Paul Volcker. All right, <laughs> yeah, we should do we should do a, a Keynes episode. Awesome, Milton Friedman one. Yeah, exactly. Anyway.